Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2. Shout for, the, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Amen. We'll ask you to stand as you are able, and we're going to sing number 543 till the storm passes by, and it also will be on the overhead. and every one of you on this another glorious Sunday morning that the Lord has given us and we trust as we worship and praise him we will all be blessed. In the way of announcements I would just like to announce that after the service there is cake and coffee downstairs and the cake is the leftovers from yesterday's was Ab's birthday and there's some cake left over so please come down and help yourself. Um, that's the only announcements that I really have unless somebody else has an announcement that if not, then I would like to lead you in our prayer of invocation. And as usual, in the middle of the prayer of invocation, I will be stopping for a time for you to, to do a silent personal prayer. Shall we pray? Lord God Almighty, 
we, indeed, we do come into this your house with gladness as we worship you. We acknowledge it is you who holds us in the hollow of your hand until the storm passes by. Father, this morning's Bible text very clearly shows our need to hold on to you as our sure anchor. For we only have to look at the world around us to see how the devil is deceiving people and turning them away from your saving love and grace. Hear the songs we joyfully sing to your glory. See our heads bowed in humble prayer to you at this time of personal silent prayer. Father, we do have your joy as our strength day after day. Accept this, our time of praise and adoration, as we come to be fed from your word and to encourage each other in our walk with you until, as our closing hymn so aptly puts it, we will fly away to your celestial shore. Hear our prayer and bless this service, we pray in Jesus, our dear Savior's name. Amen. As the deer pant for water, we ask you to stand number 548. time I will ask the ushers to take up your offering.
Shall we pray? Father, you give us so many opportunities to worship and praise you. You give us the opportunity of giving back to this your church. And Lord, we ask that you will bless this offering. We ask that you bless the hands that have given it. And through it all, may we continue to work for your church universal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Children's hymn number 541, The Joy of the Lord. Now, normally we ask children if they want to come forward. I don't know if anybody wishes to, but... Uh, no? Okay. We'll ask you to stand as you are able. We will sing number 541. children to come forward for the children's story. I really need the children out here. If you can't see way down back, who's going to come up? Come on up. <laughs> we won't bite, we promise. <laughs> now, uh, the adults here, adults here know that I own a sailboat, or I clean a sailboat. And uh, a sailboat always has lots of, what's this, string. Read us. Christian 
all by myself, I would be like one of these little critics. Not very strong at all. But when God calls us together to be his people, the church, then we become strong together. We're not strong alone. We are strong together. And I want all of us to remember that we become strong like this world. Not when we are a little thread, but when we are wound together with the piece of rope. Okay? So we want to remember that this morning. The church is God's people. Together, we're stronger than we are apart. Okay, so we are done. Uh, shall we have more prayer with the children? Yes, please. Okay, so let's pray with the children. So dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you love each one of us so much. And you call us to be your servants. We thank you that you do not leave us alone in this world. Put us together with your people, with the church. Help us to learn to love one another, to support and encourage each other. And we thank you for these children. We pray you bless them and encourage them as they grow in their faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You're going to go back and sit back here. Or are you going to Sunday school? Indecision. There we go. This time we will have our congregation or our pastoral prayer. Who has some praise items for this week? Such a glorious week, we have to have praise items. Greatest. prayer requests. Yes. other prayer requests and let us go to our Lord in prayer Father as is your congregation we once again bow before your throne of grace we know we have not put you in the forefront of our day-to-day -day living during this past week forgive us in your mercy and grace we pray we thank and praise you for giving us this wonderful country to live in, for the blessings that we receive daily, and how you continue to supply for our daily needs. We pray for the leadership of this country, for our prime minister, our premier, our local mayors, and all those who represent folks across this great land. May they lead with integrity, keeping those that you have entrusted to them as their main focus and not personal gain. Father, we pray for pastors and missionaries, and indeed anyone, including ourselves, who bring your word of comfort and grace to this hurting world. May we find fertile ground, may your word find fertile ground, so that through your grace the working, and the working of the Holy Spirit, your message of redemption and salvation through the blood of the cross will turn hearts towards you. We thank and praise you for this community of faith, Continue to encourage us to let our light shine in this community so others will be drawn to seek and follow you. With the Holy Spirit working within us, make us bold as we proclaim the free gift of salvation that we have in Jesus. Father, we have blessings upon blessings, and we thank you for Pastor Shannon. Keep her and Dan safe during their vacation. Indeed, Lord, keep all of those that are on vacation safe as they travel. We thank you for your healing hand of those who are sick. We thank you for comfort for those who mourn. We thank you for health and bless those. We ask that you bless those in the medical profession. 
We thank you for retirement and nursing homes and be with our dear members residing in them. Harvey and Alice, Herb and Gladys, Irene, Grace, Joyce, Ab, and Florence. We praise you that along with the Perry and the Lemke family for the celebration of Herb and Ab's birthday this past week. We praise you for the love that you have given them and for the grace that you have given them for long life. And Lord, we thank you for another gift that you give us, and that is weddings. Yes, I attended a wedding two, a week ago, and there was a wedding yesterday. Lord, bless those weddings. May the couple find you as the main source of their life, that they may continue to grow and love you as they live their life together. And yes, Lord, we do have prayer requests for those in need. We ask that you be with Bonnie, Ruth, Joel, Jeff, Norm, and Zachary. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you have given Pastor Ted. Bless him as he opens your word and brings your message a sure anchor. Bless this service as we bring glory to you, for, to bring glory for your mighty majesty. For, for to you we bring praise, we bring adoration. It is to you that we dedicate this worship service. For you, out, you reach out your arms of love and you gather us in. You alone are holy. Continue to work in each of our hearts and souls so we seek you first. In Jesus' name again, we do pray. Amen. At this time, it is my privilege to welcome Ted to our pulpit once again. I had, to, I had to slip back for a minute because so I'd left the bulletin with my wife, my lovely wife, and then Bob whispers in my ear as I'm coming up, uh, you'll finish off the rest of the service, will you? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, where are the hymns? Oh, I don't see the hymns. Oh, I better take it and grab the bulletin back. Um, I invite you to uh, turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy. Chapter 3, verse 10, is where we'll start reading. And I just invite you to uh, follow along as we listen to God's Word. It's also, is it up on the overhead this morning? Oh, it's on, the back, oh, it's on your bulletin. If you'd like to see it, it's in the bulletin as well. So we're going to begin at uh, verse 10. And it says, You... However, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. <clears throat> while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know from those whom you have learned it, how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. 
Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Thanks be to God for his word this morning. As I was uh, getting ready for this sermon, and I have to confess, uh, last week I was invited to speak at the North Sauble Community Church, and uh, I was also invited at the same, about the same time to speak at this church this Sunday. So I prepared one sermon, sharing it with you twice, and so I was thinking a little bit about how I have come to be associated with this area of the province. And uh, I've had many associations, actually, over the years, over many years, with this part of Ontario. Uh, as a child, I uh, would have, uh, my parents brought me up to the Sauble Beach area. Uh, we went to enjoy the swimming. We also were meeting neighbors who had a cottage up at Sauble Beach. I've taken my children to Sauble Beach on more than one occasion because I was thinking about occasion when uh, Lorraine was working and I took the kids in the middle of the week up to Sauble Beach. But then there was another time uh, that we had come together as family and it was one of those, you know, those blazing hot days and you're out on the beach and there's not a speck of shade to be found anywhere. Um, so there are those occasions. We've also traveled up in this area with our children at various times up to Tobermory and all of that. And for work, I became more acquainted with this part of the province when I began to work for Chapman's Ice Cream, and I was delivering to the stores in this area. So I got to know where all the stores were, where all the loading docks were, and where all the people would come and gather. And so I uh, had many opportunities to be up in this area, but my closer involvement with this area goes back to a boat. As a young adult, I uh, owned a sailing dinghy. I still actually own it. Um, Lorraine is always pestering me about doing something with it um, because it is in need of some repair. So it's still sitting in the backyard. But uh, a few years ago, when it was still in more uh, uh, better condition, my son said to me, uh, why don't we get the sailboat out again? So I got the sailboat out and I started refurbishing it. And some of the wooden parts were a little worse for wear, so they had to be sanded and cleaned and varnished again. And so we got the sailboat ready to go out, and we went sailing. And I enjoyed that opportunity to go out sailing in this little sailing dinghy. Uh, but I realized my older, less flexible body didn't enjoy a sailing dinghy quite as much as I remembered. And so my wife, Lorraine, graciously allowed me to consider buying a larger sailboat. And so just over four years ago, we purchased a new-to-us 26-foot McGregor sailboat. And at the same time, we decided, as we were considering how we would use the sailboat, where we would keep the sailboat, and so on, we came upon the marina at Wyarton as our first choice. And so we have kept our sailboat at the Wyarton Marina ever since, in the summertime. And we spend more of our summer recreation time in this area and in this community. Now sailors, even if they're timid sailors like the reeds are, uh, like to sail. And in our limited experiences of sailing, we have discovered some very interesting places, and I want to tell you about one this morning. And the place I want to tell you about is called Wingfield Basin. There, I see someone, uh, last Sunday, no one knew where Wingfield Basin was, but I have a sailor over here on there. Bob knows where Wingfield Basin is. Anybody else know where Wingfield Basin is? Oh, see, so a few people here know where Wingfield Basin is. It's up at Cabot Head, and uh, it is a very interesting little harbor. It is a tiny harbor, and it is a harbor that you could conceivably sail right by if you didn't know it was there. It is that small. The entrance is extremely narrow, and it is hard to see if you're out, even not too far offshore, it is hard to see. 
And the way you find your way into Wingfield Basin is you line up the range markers. And there's two of them, and when you get them in a row, you're on the right heading to go safely into Wingfield Basin. And it's a very interesting little harbor. Outside Georgian Bay can be stormy, wave-tossed, and you sail into Wingfield Basin and all of a sudden everything is calm. And the water is smooth. It is a good place to shelter in storm, except for one thing. The bottom of Wingfield Basin is very soft, and it does not hold an anchor very well. And so it is possible to be, you think you're in, it's nice and smooth, but the wind is still blowing, it is nice and smooth, but the wind can still blow your boat and push hard against the boat. And you can actually have your boat pushed right up on shore in Wingfield Basin. You wouldn't think it, but you could, because your anchor will drag. And so the story is that uh, old time sailors would, uh, as they were going into Wingfield Basin to shelter from a storm, they would set their anchor outside of the basin as they were going in, out on the beach where it is more stony and where you can get a good grip with your anchor. And they would let their anchor chain go follow them as they went back into the harbor. And then the anchor would be set outside the harbor, but they would be safe inside the harbor and they would there shelter through the storm. So any sailor is going to tell you that when you're going to anchor your boat, you want to be sure that that anchor is going to hold in place. And you don't want it dragging, you don't want the boat moving in the middle of the night. I can remember sleepless nights when we were anchored and thinking, are we moving? And in our boat, when you're down below, you don't see very much and you don't out through the little tiny windows that are only about that wide in our boat and you're trying to peer out in the middle of the night trying to get a sense of are we in the same place you really can't tell so I'd be popping that one night I can remember we pop my must pop my head out three or four times open the hatch up pop my head out oh no we're still in the same spot and we met some people a few weeks ago um, that had to be towed back into Wyarton because they lost their battery power throughout the night and the anchor alarm didn't go off and their anchor shifted and they ended up washed up on um, uh, was it Hay Island or White Cloud? White Cloud Island. Uh, they, uh, they got washed up on White Cloud Island. Thankfully it wasn't bad damage, but they couldn't get their motor started because they lost all their battery power. So it's important to have a good anchor. And even in our lives as Christians, it is important to have a good anchor. We live in North America, we live in a society that cannot be in any way, shape, or form considered to be Christian. Christian principles and values have little, if any, impact in shaping a public opinion and the making of public law. And there is also a desire in North American society to shape Christianity in such a way that it will not cause anyone any offense at all. We don't want to do that. So you, they'll allow people to be Christians, but you have to be Christians the way they think you should be not the way God wants us to be. And in the storm of opinion that seeks to push us one way and pull us other ways, what is our anchor that will keep us safe in the storm of opinion that rages about us in this North American society? So as an exercise this morning, I want to have everyone grab a hold of a copy of the Bible. I want you to have it in your hands. Now, you can have your own Bible, or you can have one of the pew Bibles, but just grab a Bible. I want you to hold it in your hand. And if you don't have a Bible close to hand, share with someone else. But have a copy of the Bible in your hand. Um, everybody, everybody got a copy of the Bible in your hands right now? You have in your hand this morning the anchor that will hold you secure to your faith in Christ Jesus. Now, seeing as you have your Bible in your hands, open it up again. Back to 2 Timothy. Look at chapter 3 and verse 14. Look what it says there. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. So let's listen again to what it says. It says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now Paul is writing these words to a colleague, a younger colleague named Timothy. Paul had a relationship with Timothy. Paul mentored Timothy in his early days. And in 2 Timothy, Paul now wants to encourage and instruct Timothy in his ministry as Paul's days and his ministry draw to their conclusion. And the focus of his instruction to Timothy as Paul nears the end of his life is in our scriptures this morning. Paul advises Timothy, and through him he teaches us that the scriptures are the central part of sound Christian teaching, doctrine, and life. Without this anchor, without the anchor of the Bible and the scriptures, we are left to be blown about by the winds of contemporary whim and fancy. And for the next few moments this morning, I want us to focus and learn a few things that will help us take our stand in society today. So Paul begins to instruct his young friend Timothy. And he instructs them about the situation that the church was facing in those days. And Paul does this by beginning with the specific and then moving to a general principle. So he begins with a specific situation and moves to a general principle. He reminds Timothy of the life that he had lived and of the persecutions that he had faced. So Paul says, Timothy, you know who I am. I don't have to tell you a whole lot. And in fact, in a very short sentence, Paul outlines the things. And, and as he's mentioning these things, Timothy is going to be going back in his mind and he's going to be thinking, yeah, I know what Paul is like. I watched him as a young man on those missionary trips where we traveled together, sharing the gospel with people. I watched him, and I know what it's like. I know what he was like. I know what kind of life he lived, what kind of faith he proclaimed, and how it impacted his own life. I know what it's like. And I know about the persecutions Paul faced. I saw them. I saw when he was thrown in jail. I saw when he was beaten. I know about the persecutions he faced. That's the specific. And we know much about Paul, too. Paul is not a mystery to us. If we want to know more about Paul, we just hear again, pick up the scripture. We can turn to the book of Acts. And we can read about Paul's life for Jesus as a missionary in the first century in the Roman Empire, as Paul shared his faith with people that he met on his journeys. And we also know about Paul because Paul wrote many of the letters that are included in this scripture. And in many of those letters, Paul takes time as he is talking about various things that are important in the life of faith, Paul takes time and he tells a little bit about himself. So we have those sections that we can learn about Paul too. We know that Paul lived for Christ. We know that he traveled and shared the good news about Jesus. We know about the hardships. We know about the persecutions, at least some of them, that he suffered because he belonged to Christ. This is who Paul was and is. But Paul doesn't leave Timothy with this general obser this observation about who he was. We know who Paul was, but he moves to a general conclusion. It's found in verses 12 and 13 in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul is quite clear. 
Christians will face persecution. It's a fact. There is a cost to following Christ. And those who do not follow Christ will continue in their delusion. Doesn't that sound a lot like today? People don't want to hear the words of Christ. Oh, they like some of the stuff. But the hard teachings? Don't want to hear it. Don't want to do it. Don't want to follow it. To follow Christ, if we are to follow Christ, there is always a cost. Society wants to shape us in its image. It does not want to hear the call of a righteous God to live holy lives. That's the way it is. So how should we live in a world that's like that? We're not all that different from that first century. As much as the technologies will change and uh, there are many improvements, people really aren't all that much different than from now. How do we live? How do we distinguish the truth from the lie? So Paul then proceeds on. This is the facts. We're going to move on. Paul reminds Timothy of the foundation of his faith. He says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you have known those whom, from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So we had talked a bit this morning about Paul, someone whom we know very much about in the Scriptures. But then there are those other people in the New Testament and in the Old Testament as well uh, that are considered to be the minor characters of the Scriptures. And Timothy is one of those minor characters because he's just not mentioned that often in the Scriptures. But Timothy, actually, we know a little bit more about him than we knew of some of these other characters. There's um, people in the Bible... Uh, remember the woman at the well, she appears in the scriptures there and then disappears from a uh, biblical record anyway, disappears again. So we don't know much about her, but Timothy, we know a little bit more about. He is first mentioned by name in Acts chapter 16. Uh, and it says in Acts chapter 16 at verse 1, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra where a disciple named Timothy lived. There he is. His mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in the area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So as we can see just from these three little verses in Acts chapter 16, we can see three things about Timothy. Or at least several things about Timothy. Timothy was a follower of Christ. So his conversion to faith in Christ Jesus probably happened during Paul's first missionary journey. Timothy's mother was both a Jew and a believer in Jesus. And Paul makes Timothy a companion on his second missionary journey. And he becomes a mentor to the young Timothy, as he grows in his faith and in his ministry. And as the years then pass, and Paul nears the end of his days, Paul views Timothy as one of his most valued co-workers in the faith. A very interesting situation. Even near the end, Paul wants to take time and remind Timothy of the foundations of his faith. I think all of us need to be reminded of the foundations of our faith from time to time. He says, Remember how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation in Christ Jesus. You see, there is a great advantage to knowing the Scriptures from an early age. And I can testify to this. I grew up in a family that loved the Lord. 
from the earliest days, days that I cannot remember myself, from the earliest days I attended a church and a Sunday school where the Word of God was faithfully taught. And in that family and in that situation and in that church, I was challenged to make the faith of others my own faith. And that is the challenge for us today. It continues to be the challenge today. We need to take the lessons that we have learned from the wisdom of the Scriptures and apply them by turning to faith in Christ Jesus. Now, if we do not know the Scriptures, and I think all of us feel that we do not know the Scriptures, if we do not know the Scriptures, do not fret. It is never too late. Learn the Holy Scriptures, for they are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. But there is an objection. Why should we trust the Bible, some might say? Isn't it just another ancient religious book like all the others? And the answer is to be found in verse 16 in Timothy. Paul's answer to Timothy is, all scripture is God-breathed. Now there is a technical theological expression, and it is the word inspiration or the doctrine of inspiration. And that is what Paul is writing about here. Now when we think about the word inspire, uh, we may think of a speaker who inspires his audience. An inspiring speaker is someone who will challenge us or moves us to adopt a course of action. And it happens. It can happen in the church. It can happen when we hear a special moment, a special speaker who speaks for God. It can happen in other situations as well. We can be inspired to adopt a course of action in the political realm. And that's what we think of when we think of inspiring. We think of something that is exciting. We think of something that is the opposite of boring. But that's not the idea of biblical inspiration. The biblical inspiration that Paul is talking about in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, is different. Timothy uses a unique word, a unique in the New Testament word. Uh, it is the Greek word theoph. Now I'm going to struggle with this word. Theopneustos. Theopneustos. And it is a compound of two Greek words. The word theos, which is the word for God, and the word pneumo, which is the Greek word to, which means to breathe. Thus we have this translation. All scripture is theopneustos. All scripture is God-breathed. Now, I want you to be able to grasp what this idea is all about. So I want you to think about how each one of us speaks. So when we speak, we draw breath into our lungs. And then as we begin to speak, we begin to push some of that breath out of our lungs. And it passes over our vocal cords, which are vibrating. And then as it passes over the vocal cords, it passes by the various nasal cavities that we have which amplify and shape the sound. And then the sound comes out of our mouths. And we organize these sounds into words. And then we organize our words into sentences. And then we are communicating ideas. You see, think of it this way. You have come this morning to church and you are listening to a sermon and the words that you are hearing this morning are Ted breathed. They have come out of my mouth. They are my words. Now there's an exception. The exception is when I am reading scripture. Then the words belong to God. I am quoting somebody else when I read scripture. But the words that you're listening to, more, to me this morning are Ted brief. They are my words. But when we read 
the scripture, we are reading God's words. They are God-breathed. They've come out of God's mouth. So these words in this Bible and in your Bible, they're God's words. And God has used a whole variety of ways to communicate to his people down through the generations. And God spoke through this variety of ways to ordinary people, people like you and me, who then wrote them down. That's why Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 say, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. God's last and best revelation of himself was his son Jesus, whom the scripture sometimes simply calls as the Word. And this revelation of the Son is also recorded in the Bible, primarily in the Gospels, but not exclusively. And that is what inspiration means. God uses ordinary people to write down his Word so that it is in such a way, or in such a way, so that it becomes in its final form, its final product, it is God-breathed. It is God's Word. So the Bible you have in your hand this morning, it is the Word of God. So the Bible, it is able to make us wise for salvation, and it is God's Word to us. But the Bible also equips us. It says, all Scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So how does this scripture that we have learned, that has led us to faith in Christ Jesus, how does this scripture impact our lives? Notice the four words that Paul uses here in Second Timothy. Number one, teaching. How can we know God? The Bible teaches us what God is like and how God desires that we should live. So the Bible teaches us. The second word, number two, rebuking. How does God get our attention when we persist in sinful behavior? God uses his word to point out our sin and to bring us to repentance. You may find a situation where you're seeing a brother or a sister engaged in some form of behavior that is unbecoming to their faith in Christ Jesus. And uh, as you try prayerfully to point it out to them, you can wonder why they are not listening. The best we can do in most situations is help people see what God says. It is when God removes the scales from the eyes that people then begin to see. Remember David. God had to remove the scales that he had placed over his own eyes in his sin with Bathsheba before he would repent. God wants to rebuke us and correct us, bring us back. So number three, correcting. How does, how does God correct our wrong ideas about our faith and about our life? The teaching of the Bible will help correct our wrong ideas. When we get locked into a wrong idea, sometimes it can be really hard for us to change. But God, if we uh, submit ourselves to the teaching of his word, we can see the correction that needs to take place. And the fourth word, training in righteousness. How does God get us to be more like his son? God's word will train us in righteousness and in the ways of righteousness. This is the work of God's Bible. This is the work of his word. But to what end? And the answer is quite clear. 
It says, so that the servant of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, God has something in store for each one of us to do, whether young or old. God has something in store for each one of us. When we are saved from our sin and belong to Christ, God has a job for us to do. It's not all the same job. It's not all done in the same way. But God has something he wants us to do. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Now, isn't that interesting? Before we were ready, God has prepared a job for us to do, a good work for us to do. So he has something that he wants each one of us to do. And the question we must ask of ourselves, are we ready? And the way we can be ready for what God wants us to do is to submit our lives to that final authority of God's word in our lives so that God can make us ready for every good work. Did you notice where we started as we looked at what God's word would do and where we have ended? We have started with salvation. Remember what the scriptures are? The scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And look where we have come to. We have come to service. The scripture prepares us so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Salvation and service. God's word calls us to both of these. So as we come to our time, the close of our time here together this morning, what is our challenge? What is our commission? What does God want to do with his word that will change our lives and change the world around us? In writing to Timothy, Paul gives Timothy a charge. He says, uh, this charge is in Chapter 4, verse 2 of 2 Timothy. His charge to Timothy, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Now, we tend to think of preaching as something that a preacher does even if it is only an occasional task. It is something that a preacher does. And only special people can do that. But think about what a preacher does. Think about what I have been trying to do this morning. A preacher takes the teaching of the Word of God and helps people apply that teaching to people's lives their daily lives. So if that is the task of preaching, do you think we could be doing that in someone's lives this week? Maybe through the things that we say, the things that we do, how can we influence people to see that God's Word is important, not only for us, but also for them? So our challenge is to take the Word of God, all of the Word of the God, and apply it. Apply it to our lives in such a way that we can be God's people in a broken world. So there are two challenges that I leave with you this morning. The challenge is, and because I gave you this challenge last week, I, I have to confess that I wasn't really good at it this week. Uh, but the challenge is to learn something new from the scriptures this week. You see, learning is a lifelong task. The Bible is a book. Um, in some ways, it's a very odd book because you can have passages of Scripture that you're going to know really well. You've read them many times. You've heard sermons on them, so on and so forth. 
And uh, then one day you're sitting down and you've opened your Bible up and you're starting to read and you're reading a very familiar passage of Scripture and all of a sudden something hits you. And it's an idea that you've never had before. It's from God's Word. Why haven't I seen this before? The Bible is like that. There are times when all of a sudden God will get a hold of us in a way that we have never been got a hold of before. It is that kind of a book. So learn something new from God's Word this week. And the second one is like it. First challenge, learn something new. Second challenge is seek out one way that you can act on God's teaching from the Bible this week. Now, I'm not saying you've got to take that new idea that you're going to try and learn this week and try and apply that right away. But take something that God has taught you over the years from the Scriptures and apply it this week in some way. In other words, preach the Word. Take that lesson of Scripture and apply it to your daily lives in such a way that people will say, oh, that's different. I haven't thought of it that way before. Preach the Word in your words and in your deeds. In the storms of life, we have an anchor. And our challenge as Christians is to come back to the God who has revealed himself in his word. The God who has revealed himself to us, he will keep us safe. And his word to us is completely reliable. I want us to, come as we come to the close of our service, to turn in your hymn books once again um, to 179, I'll Fly Away. Stand as you are able. this morning. We want to close with the blessing that God gives through his word. Let us pray. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.